So now we will do this a second time. And hello, Ravi, can you hear me? Hear me. Let's see, I'm, I'm sending this one live here. Okay. Looks like it's working. I think we're <laughs> This is not the easiest software in the world, but you know, it's, it is, uh, this is what happens when you start something, uh, you know, from the, from the ground up and, uh, you always have a few glitches and bugs. So hello everyone. Welcome to this week's, uh, bizpod.ninja. I'm going to do a quick, just check my LinkedIn to make sure everything is, is there. The background isn't, oh, I see Ralph Acosta saying hi. Hello, Ralph. Uh, and I'm just going to do one quick thing here. Aha. I think we are almost back. And I'm going to send that. I'm going to send that live. Well, I don't know why the background isn't working. The, uh, the title cards. But it is what it is. And we're going to move forward. So there's just two pictures of us, Ravi, on each side. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the show. We've got uh, Ravi Surin here. Uh, he is a verified business ninja, according to the rules of the dojo. Uh, he is founding uh, founder and managing partner at Roca Partners, a Los Angeles-based private equity growth uh, investment firm focused on tech-enabled services and healthcare services. Ravi previously was a principal in PE, private equity, at Aries Management. At Aries, uh, Ravi helped lead investments in healthcare services, retail and gaming, lodging and leisure, among a few other sectors. Uh, served on the board of directors of Floor and Decor, Jacuzzi Brands, OB Hospitalist Group, uh, and Unified Women's Healthcare. Prior to Aries, Ravi was a private equity investor at Bain Capital and a consultant at Bain & Company. Um, Ravi has an MBA from Harvard Business School, an MS in Management Science and Engineering, and a BS in Electrical Engineering from Stanford University. Hello, Ravi. Thanks for making the time, buddy. Yeah, Andreas, of course. Thanks for having me. Of it's course. exciting. I remember when you talked about doing a, uh, a business podcast, and uh, you've made it happen. That's great. Here, here we are. I, actually, I think I spoke to you a long time, actually more, more time, like more than I would admit to, uh, to say, but yeah, I think it was about a year, year and a half in the making. And then uh, just like everything else, yeah, COVID and Corona and being at home kind of expedited a lot of things. So it is coming together, but of course with uh, some minor hiccups. So this is our second run for those who were watching previously. I had to end the broadcast because I couldn't figure out the live feed, but we are here now. Um, Ravi is joining us. Uh, from Los Angeles, and I don't know why it says lost the bottom here, but it is Los Angeles. Uh, Ravi, uh, how are you? How have you been doing? How have you been holding up during this entire period? Uh, I can't complain, actually. I mean, it's uh, you know, it's unfortunate, obviously, what's going on and the impact it has at so many people in, in terms of health and and the economic consequences. But um, you know, fortunately, you know, the transition to work from home and and Staying in LA and uh, away from people for the most part, um, it hasn't been too bad. And uh, hopefully, we can get this under control. And uh, you know, twenty twenty one will be different. Um, but um, you know, otherwise, you know, finding time to develop new hobbies and um, and continue to work um, you know, on, on the stuff that we're doing at Roca uh, from home. Nice, nice. Yeah, um, I think many people are surprised. Um, how either productive they are or high, how either distracted they are working at home. Um, I found myself to be, I'm probably working twice as, at least 50% more compared to pre-COVID because I'm not having to travel and be distracted by all these other things. So I think a lot of people feel that way. We're probably at least 50 to 2 at productive, at least most of the people I know. And I imagine you, Robbie, you're so busy, you're probably uh, double downing on everything. So. Um, Let's get into it. Everyone, again, this is a Thursday, Friday show, about 25 minutes. That's the goal, where we bring in truths from the trenches, rock stars in their respective uh, fields, business ninjas from uh, private equity, venture capital, business development, founders, CEOs, et cetera. Episode four, Ravi, 
uh, tell me about Roca, just in general, the firm that you found and your managing partner. Uh, before you before you tell me exactly about the firm and what your focus is, what does Roca stand for exactly? Yeah, so uh, this ties into our strategy, uh, but Roca is an acronym for Return on Customer Acquisition. Uh, so what that means is really, I mean, it ties into to what we do, which I can share, but uh, whenever we're looking at investment opportunities, we're hyper-focused on the underlying customer unit economics of that business. You know, how yep. much are they investing in sales or marketing, brand, business development, and then what is the behavior of their customers in terms of their you know, lifetime value, but also customer advocacy, the margin mm -hmm. profile, the contribution of, of those customers. And for us, you know, we're focused on one side as investors, making sure that those unit economics are attractive. So mm -hmm. that return on customer acquisition profile is attractive, but also as partners to the companies that we work with, you know, trying to identify ways that we can help improve that profile for the company. So how can we enable the company to be more capital efficient in their growth so that every dollar they invest to acquire a customer, instead of turning that into two or three dollars, they can turn that into four or five dollars in profit over time. And so our process is really involved, you know, a lot of customer analytics, uh, marketing analytics, understanding uh, the customer segments. And, and oftentimes what we find is that the most valuable customers um, are really the way to drive the most profitable growth is by having the company differentially focus their spend on the most valuable customers. Got it. Thank so you. Sorry, lot, long answer to uh, no, no. a very simple all good, question. All good. But before we get there, so that's, that's a, now I know where the acronym comes from, despite me having known about the company name and uh, you founding the company for how long ago was it? When did you start the Almost five firm? years ago. Almost five, five years, years ago. ago. Yeah. Interesting. Um, and so for the folks that are listening here today, so you started your own PE practice and firm five years ago. What was the major momentum behind that? Um, and we'll, we can get into, you know, your previous experience. Obviously, we know you worked at Bain, uh, Capital, uh, and Aries Management. But what was the principle? Because a lot of folks would want to just be in that position and stay in those previous roles and just grow up, grow uh, over time in, within those organizations. You took an incredible leap of faith uh, to go start your own practice and do that. And, you know, coming from uh, an individual such as myself who knows what it's like to start your own advisory practice or investment fund and, and, and this way, it's incredibly hard and can be taxed. So what motivated you and propelled you um, to leave the, the comforts of a global brand name where you're doing quite well for sure at that time and fast forward five years, you would of course be at a, at a different level, but what propelled you to get to start your own firm? Yeah, for me, it was, you know, kind of as, as I, at the time, you know, when I was trying to make this decision, uh, I found that the companies that I was most excited in working with tended to be the companies that were mm -hmm. still run by their founders. I really enjoyed working with entrepreneurs. There's something about, you know, the enthusiasm and, and resourcefulness uh, that entrepreneurs have when they're building companies. And, um, you know, really at the firms that I was working with before or working at before, you know, sometimes we're investing in companies that were entrepreneur led. Uh, many times the companies had really scaled to a point where the original founders were no longer there or maybe they're in advisory capacity or board level, uh, but they had brought in, you know, quote unquote, professional management, um, you know, hired CEOs and things like that. Um, and what I found is that, you know, really what was most enjoyable was working with entrepreneurs, whether that's to recruit uh, teams and help and build the companies. Um, but really just getting to spend time with them and in, in developing the strategy and scaling the business. Um, so what I found is that in order to do that in a more consistent way, uh, really the most effective way to do that was to invest in, in smaller businesses, you know, at the time at, at Aries and even before that at Bank Capital, uh, given the size of the funds and the size of investments that we would have to make in any one company, you know, those companies were, were typically, you know, beyond that level of scale and maturity. Um, and so really the, the thinking was the best way to do that was to invest in these, you know, what I call lower middle market or, you know, what the industry would call lower middle market companies, sub right. 500 million in enterprise value. And, and um, you know, it'd be exciting to also start a company, be an entrepreneur and, and do that. So that's kind of coupling the entrepreneurial itch with the desire to work with entrepreneurs uh, really led to the formation of Roca. Thank you. Um, 
what are the biggest learning lessons and like business learnings that you were able that's helped you be successful at Roca that you've that you can attribute back from Aries and Bain Capital? Like if you could parlay kind of all these experiences together, what is the what is the thing that is your rocket fuel? Um, as you um, embark and you know building Roca into a, into a large advisory and inv investment firm. Yeah, well, I'd say you know yeah, Roca today is is still you know quite small. Um, so yeah. <laughs> there's still a, a ways to go. But I, I'd say the things that I find are most important, whether or not it's starting and running a firm or um, you know investing in general. You know, I think that the two attributes um, you know I'd say are important are you know, patience, um, whether or not that's patience in terms of building a firm or patience in terms of finding attractive investments and then also focus, uh, which is uh, there's, you know, as an investor, there's so many different areas to invest. Uh, there's so many different, you know, stages in companies, types of companies, but having focus is important, not only to really uh, make sure you're spending your time in areas that you know well, uh, but also not getting distracted by things where, you know, there can be a lot of different situations that pop up that can take, a, you know, time away from, you know, what what you're most, uh, I say, experienced in and, and excited about. Um, and I'd say the third element, if I had to pick a third one, would be just having a, a strategic plan in terms of what your approach is that you can repeat, you know, and have a, a process um, that you can repeat and, and hone in on, because uh, I think that a aids with, you know, being uh, both focused and also... Uh, and it can help drive more success that way. Yeah, thanks, Roger, for that. Uh, why the focus on later stage or growth stage PE as opposed to earlier stage? Why is it, and we all know that there's different phases uh, in investment focus, um, all the way from early stage C venture capital to kind of traditional venture capital series A, B, and C to growth stage uh, private equity and even late stage private equity. Why did you choose the area? Um, uh, your particular focus area for private equity as opposed to the others? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a combination of just kind of where our experience is um, and then also, you know, I think where our skill set is and, on, and then a combination of you know, also where, where we have interest. But where we are focused is really in profitable, typically profitable companies. Uh, they may have raised capital before and many times they've never raised capital before so we would be the first kind of institutional capital investors and we're partnering with entrepreneurs who have been able to scale their businesses um you know if they've raised capital before without a significant amount of capital to get there um and so you know i think part of it is you know we mm -hmm. we know that if if they've been able to to be profitable or scale their profitability without any outside capital or without much outside capital it means they have an attractive uh, business model from a unit economic standpoint, they're getting you know attractive quick and quick paybacks on their investments. I think, I think the other element is the culture of the company and the resourcefulness that the company has uh, to scale, uh, but also the maturity level of the company that they are profitable or they have a scaled amount of revenue so that we can really prove out in our own due diligence, our own analysis, mm -hmm. we can really prove out that, okay, the unit economics are proven. Here's the opportunities that we can have to drive further improvement. But really it's about you know having a lot more certainty around the controllable levers for growth. And so I think venture stage is exciting. Um, you know, it's an area where, you know, we see a lot of opportunity, but we don't spend time there because there's just not enough data and history in the businesses for us to get comfort uh, to it. make investments. Got it. Ravi, uh, tell, me, tell me a little bit about how has the PE market changed during COVID? Um, and what do you think it's going to, do you think it's going to be permanently altered in a way that we don't even know yet uh, when, when COVID is over? So how has it changed during this, this period? And will there be any, will there be any ramifications afterwards, like permanent changes, do you think? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, and I don't know if I'm in a great position to find an answer on that, but, you know, I'd say surprisingly a lot has not changed, frankly. Um, I think given how dramatic uh, the impact that COVID has had on, on companies yeah. and people's lives, um, you know, I, would, I would have said in hindsight now, kind of seeing what the impact has been, I would have expected a lot more, you know, either companies that would be uh, distressed from this environment, 
mm-hmm. uh, and not able to raise capital or, you know, I think companies having um, to make more significant changes uh, to their go forward business plans. You know, I think there definitely is material change and material impact to certain segments of the economy for sure. Um, but I think, you know, I'd say overall the level of impact given the magnitude of the, the disruption is not as significant. Um, but you know, I think as far as, yeah. I mean, there's probably a lot of, there's probably assets now that are much more attractive or within reach from an, uh, from an acquisition from a PE perspective that may have not been, you know, for, for sale or um, would be uh, an opportunity from a PE perspective, let's say even last year. Would you agree with that? That depending on the asset classes, it, you know, there might be more attractive deals in private equity as opposed to a year ago? Intuitively, that's what I would have expected, right? Just given um, you know how disruptive this environment has been to companies and and the impact to their the fundamentals, at least in the near term. Um, but I think you know at least what we've observed is that you have a set of companies that have been significantly materially impacted right. by COVID. You know, yeah. take the travel and leisure industry. Right. Uh, a number of those businesses are highly distressed, and unfortunately, you know, a number of those are not able to raise capital, you know, outside of bankruptcy or something like that. And, you know, there's that extreme impact and there will be structural changes to the, you know, the capital structure in the near term, the investor base, things like that. Mm -hmm. That's, that's a significant change, but driven by the circumstances. And then you've got companies that have been the beneficiary of this environment, uh, you know, whether it's certain technology companies like Zoom or others, um, where they're seeing a significant uplift in their business. And I think that'll, you know, persist for, you know, the foreseeable future, uh, even yeah. in a post COVID environment. But I think, uh, then you've got everyone that's in between, that's kind of either not significantly benefited, not significantly hurt, but right. kind of making, you know, kind of riding out this environment. That's how I characterize it. And I'd say for the most part, those companies, um, you know, they have access to capital. I think the markets continue to be strong, both on the debt and equity side. Um, but I think in general, it's probably, um, you know, companies that don't need to do anything are waiting. Um, you know, they're not necessarily looking to raise capital, not looking to sell their business or transact. And that's probably the right thing just given, uh, the level of disruption. Um, but in terms of like, what is the, you know, the long-term consequences of COVID, I I would say that it's, it's really driven an acceleration of a lot of the trends that were already taking place. Right. So if you take businesses that uh, were strong, you know, on the say a technology front, uh, and they're the beneficiaries of COVID, they probably had a lot of tailwind supporting their business models anyways. And like this is food delivery, post food delivery. Yeah. Yeah. So it's accelerating those trends. And I think a lot of the companies that are, you know, we saw on the front end, uh, highly distressed without certain retailers, uh, or other companies, I think those right. companies were probably uh, trending down anyways. And this accelerated that unfortunately, Retail um, and, then, and then there's companies that have had kind of very distinct and and specific yeah. harsh consequences would would not have had any impact absent this, like the travel and leisure industry again. And I think there, uh, you know, what we're seeing is the companies that are you know have strong business models, even though they're not thriving today, or or maybe they're even suffering today. I think there's still a lot of investor interest in those businesses because people can see beyond, you know, call it 2021. Uh, you know, depending on how bearish you are and how long this lasts, but right. I think people can see beyond 2021 and expect a recovery and want to invest behind and, and support the companies that are ultimately, you know, going to be the you know the view is going to be the winners in the future. Got it. Thank you for that. And by the way, uh, for folks who are watching, we have folks live right now. If anyone has any questions, um, and I don't think you can see that yet from your from your perspective, Ravi, but I have a separate master window. Okay. If anyone wants to ask any questions to Ravi, you know, feel free. And I, I can, I can certainly take a look and decide whether I want to ask it. <laughs> <laughs> um, Ravi, what's the most, like, tell me about a current deal you're working on. What's kind of the most exciting thing you're working on right now. Can you share uh, with, with our viewers from, from Aroka, from your perspective, what's the current deal that, you, that, you, that you're working on right now that you really like? Cause I know you're working on several things. Yeah, I mean, we have we have several portfolio companies, you know, really like all of them, which is why 
you know, we, we made investments in a partner with those companies, but can get of a, an example of one uh, just to give a flavor of what we do. So just kind of taking a step back uh, in terms of what Roca does, we invest in uh, technology enabled services companies and healthcare services, typically companies that are, um, you know, above 30 million of revenue and, you know, typically above 5 million of EBITDA. Um, but there's no hard lines around that. And uh, we're flexible investors, so we do control investments, we do minority uh, investments, uh, and then we also do, you know, debt investments or convertible debt investments. So we're we're very flexible in, in trying to solve companies' needs and and founders' needs when they're looking to bring in capital partners. Um, you know, an example of of you know the types of things that we do in healthcare, we're very focused on value-based care models. So investing in healthcare services companies that can drive to not only higher quality care, but also uh, do so in a way that lowers the cost of care. And ultimately, as we all know, like the healthcare costs in the US are very high and, and unsustainably so. And there's a lot of incentives in today's world that drive to, to these higher costs um, and, and also impact uh, quality adversely. And so, you know, what we do is we have a thematic approach where we identify what are the areas that we really wanna spend time in where we think there's a problem that we can find a company that can solve that um, and then go find those companies and see if there's a way to partner with them. And if there is, you know, once we partner, really help them scale. Um, so an example of a company uh, that we invested in in 2018 uh, is a company called the Oncology Institute. Mm -hmm. The Oncology Institute is a Southern California based medical oncology practice. So they treat cancer patients. Um, and what's really interesting about their business model is they've recognized kind of from the founding um, that there are some major challenges in the oncology industry that medical oncologists, you know, the way they get reimbursed as a practice is they get paid a margin on the drugs that they prescribe, a percentage based margin, uh, mm -hmm. which means that they tend to have an, at least an economic incentive uh, to overutilize chemotherapy. Uh, and when there's multiple drugs that they can utilize or, right. or prescribe, they're economically incentivized to prescribe higher cost drugs, uh, which mm. is why this field, medical oncology, has one of the highest rates of cost inflation in all of healthcare. So healthcare, the industry is already very large, expensive, and growing, and then right. medical oncology is is in particular, uh, you know, one of those that's experiencing a lot of that cost inflation. And so this company, the Oncology Institute, recognized that some of these incentives uh, create adverse outcomes because not only when do you, not only when is uh, chemotherapy is overutilized as it leads to higher costs, but it right. it also can lead to lower quality care. Um, and so their model is really to remove those incentives. They operate more in a managed care setting uh, where all the physicians are compensated for you know their time and effort and, and treatment of patients, but have no income that's either greater or lower based on what they prescribe. And that ultimately, uh, and you know, we were really pleased when after we made the investment, Stanford University released a study that highlighted that Oncology Institute, this specific practice, led to meaningfully better quality in terms of patient satisfaction, lower hospital admissions, lower ER visits, uh, but also meaningfully lower costs. Um, so it's an example of the type of business that we get excited about and really helping them scale. So we partner with founders. Uh, we've helped bring in people to the team and then help bring in relationships uh, on the customer side, payer contracts that can really help them scale, not only here in California, but also uh, across uh, you know, other states into, into other states. Thank you for that. Uh, so we do have a, we do have a question uh, from Sean Meyer from uh, live from from the feed right here. Hey, we'll Sean. So Robbie says hello, Sean, and I say hello. How's it going? Would love to hear Robbie's thoughts on the disruption in healthcare he expects from AI, specific to healthcare services. Uh, how does how does he think AI will affect healthcare healthcare services in the future? So yeah, I guess that's a great question. I, and I know that's a lot to unpack. Um, so what, what's your what's your your one hundred second summary on that? Okay, 100, I've been too long-winded, so I need to speed it up. Um, no, no, so great, that's good. great, great question. I mean, I think AI is absolutely critical in terms of helping solve a lot of the challenges in healthcare. I think the biggest, one of the biggest challenges that healthcare is facing outside of this escalating cost issue is a shortage of providers. So there just aren't enough physicians in, across almost all specialties 
to treat the patient needs. And so we need to leverage technology to really uh, extend the, the reach and capability of physicians and, and their bandwidth um, and other providers. And so AI specifically is one of those, um, you know, or the AI technology or other tools can really help serve as a, an aid to physicians in their in terms of their decision making um, or a lot of the diagnostics that are done. So as an example, um, you know, right now you have pathology, which is reviewing uh, tissue samples and reviewing images uh, to assess, you know, what kind of either disease or issue may exist uh, for that patient uh, with, you know, AI machine learning of a lot of different images, uh, we can uh, provide a certain level of redundant physician review or pathology review. Um, and maybe over time, uh, well, that can enhance the quality of the review and, and, and speed up the process for these physicians. Maybe over time, it can, it can reduce the need for physicians. So it's, it's a good right. thing. I don't know if it's a good thing, but my, my father is now a retired pathologist. So yeah, uh, I, maybe it was a good time to retire before the AI takes over that role. But I've always heard, yeah, pathology is going to be one of the very first areas of, of disruption, radiology, dermatology. These are still kind of like, I think, on the forefront of what AI can, you know, it can, it can support or it can disrupt to make these professions uh, or these uh, specializations um, require less human interaction than previously, right? Would yeah, and I think the nice, the nice thing about healthcare and AI as a disruptor is that the physicians and the other providers, they're welcoming it because we know the, the status quo is there's just not enough physician support. There's not enough physician capacity uh, to treat all the patient needs. And so yeah. my, actually my sister is a dermatologist. She's a professor at Stanford and uh, she actually does research around AI and, and leveraging machine learning to address some of the, the challenges within, you know, one is, you know, from a diagnosing or identifying treatment for skin cancer, but also mm -hmm. as a way to provide that kind of physician support. Um, so I think there's huge opportunities there. I think, you know, already the technology is there and the solutions exist. And there, it's just a matter of, um, you know, people getting comfort that, you know, that can reduce the dependency on provider intervention and, and review. Got it. Thank you for that. Um, so we're at the tail end of our show. I always like to um, ask a few qu fun questions just <laughs> because, well, I mean, if this isn't fun, then why are we even doing this? So thank you for, for all of that uh, background, background, Ravi. Uh, before I get to actually fun questions, I want to ask you one, one final thing. Um, which I'm sure you you would like to share with viewers and folks. Are there any particular industries or companies right now? And you know, I don't need like you don't have to go into great detail. But what are the if there is like one or two types of deals that you that Roca is most interested in right now? What are they over the next year or two? Who, what do you want? To yeah, see? So, yeah. No, appreciate that question. Um, so a few different areas that we have interest, and this isn't this is, definitely doesn't capture it all. But uh, we really like. Uh, tech-enabled professional services, so companies in professional services uh, or companies that are focused on the small business community as a separate thesis, uh, but technology companies that can service uh, those sectors um, or are embedded into those sectors and help them go to market in a more, um, I'd say, attractive way from an economic standpoint in terms of the unit economics, but also in terms of the quality of their service delivery. Uh, so we're really focused on companies that have leveraged technology and built a strong brand uh, in the way they go to market uh, and, and can consolidate some certain fragmented markets and professional services and, and with servicing the small business community. Um, and then within healthcare, it kind of goes back to value-based care models. So uh, also typically leveraging technology, but companies or providers that have been able to deliver care uh, in a higher quality and lower cost setting. Got it. Thank you for that, Ravi. Uh, two minutes, fun questions. Uh, you're cooping up at home, I imagine, like we, we, we said at the beginning, uh, pretty much every day, all day, like everyone else. What are you mostly eating these days? What's your favorite food at home? Yeah, so um, fortunately, I've been uh, in uh, quarantine with my girlfriend, Tiny. So you know her, and she's a fantastic cook. So the food varies quite a bit. Um, so she'll make Indian food some days and uh, you know, whole, whole, uh, variety. Um, so well, she's Australian, so 
She's are Australian, any... so a lot of healthy food, and uh, what's the, fresh what's produce. The preferred Aussie, what's the preferred Aussie dish of the house? I'm trying to think if we have uh, <laughs> any Australian food recently. Um, I don't know. Maybe that's actually something that we should do next. But uh, but yeah, we've been cooking a lot at home. Um, you know, take out selectively. Um, we did eat out a couple times. You know, took that risk uh, in, out, in outdoor restaurants. Oh yeah, a few weeks ago you could actually. I think I think California law just changed again, right? A couple of weeks ago you could go to a restaurant. I think outside. Yeah, so we we did that a couple of times. But yeah, for the most part, it's been eating out. Um, I mean, eating at home, but eating outside in the backyard. Yeah. And what sort of workouts are you doing at home to keep fit? Because I know you like to keep fit. Um, well, as you can tell, since this is a video, I haven't been working out as much as, uh, as I'd like, but um, I've been kind of streaming uh, yoga classes on YouTube. Um, and uh, shout out to, I, I know a company you know well, Fit On. I you know, experimented with them. Um, so it's a nice new app. Uh, but yeah, on YouTube, I've been uh, streaming. Uh, there's one blogger or, or kind of YouTube uh, workout person, uh, Boho Beautiful. Uh, okay. So I've been, yep. been uh, doing yoga there. And then a few other kind of various classes online. That's great. Ravi, thank you so much for uh, being on this week's show. I appreciate it as always. Um, Hope to catch up with you in person as we uh, used to do pre-COVID. Um, and thank you for your background on, on, on Roki, your true business ninja. Everyone, thank you for listening in. And after the show is live, of course, we'll, we'll have a lot of folks watch this um, as well. So it is recorded for those who've missed the show or would like to share it on. Thank you, Ravi. Every Thursday, Friday, bizpod.ninja where we interview uh, business ninjas in their respective fields from M&A to private equity, venture capital founders, CEOs, et cetera. Thanks for tuning in and we are signing off. Thanks Andreas, congrats. Thank you.